Good afternoon. My name is Al Bundy. I want to welcome each and every one of you here. We're just delighted that you are here to join us for this very special Black History Month event. You know, when we look back at our American history, slavery has had an indelible mark on this country. Because although we've made a lot of progress, we still have a way to go. Some of you may realize that so many betray blackness as an enemy of all that is smart or sophisticated or uplifting or worthwhile emulating or transmitting. But the dead American culture owes to black folks cannot be easily erased. So we have to fight hard to keep the historical stories from being miscast, distorted, or poorly told. And that's why we celebrate Black History Month. With that said, let me introduce to you a man who is making his own history here at Essex County College. He has started our new social justice movement and program and so many other initiatives to put Essex County College on a road to a great future. Please welcome our leader, the champion for Essex County College, our president, Dr. Anthony E. Monroe. Let's hear it. Thank you, Al. It is always a pleasure and honor uh, to address the family here at Essex County College. Please come on in and get settled in because we're going to have an exciting lecture today. I'm delighted, I'm pleased, and I'm honored that today we have as our guest speaker the Honorable, and I said the Honorable, Ross Baraka, the mayor of the great city of Newark. Let's give him a round of applause. He has served, and I emphasize served, the residents and particularly the youth of Newark for many years as an educator and as a principal at Central High School. Just a few months ago, I had the opportunity and pleasure to sit down with the mayor and share with him the vision of this college, of this house, with our focus on students first. And I want to publicly thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your unwavering support of Essex County College, not just since our meeting, but for many, many years. So thank you again. Let's give him a round of applause. Today we are holding our ninth annual Garvey and Krumah Lecture Series program. This lecture series has placed a bright spotlight on black history, both in this month and throughout the year. We are here today in the Dr. J. Harry Smith Hall, and in the back of the room you'll see a plaque hung in his honor. For those of you who may not be aware, when Dr. Smith became president of Essex County Colleges in 1971, he had the distinction of being the first African American to serve as college president in New Jersey. We have the honor of sitting in the audience today with our president emeritus, Dr. Zach Yamba, who has the distinction of being one of the longest serving, if not the longest serving, college presidents, not only in the state of New Jersey, but in the United States. Dr. Young, please rise and recognize Dr. Young. It now gives me pleasure to introduce Dr. Akil Kalfani, Professor of Sociology and Africana Studies. He's been with us for a number of years, about 15 or so, and since 2006, he has served as the director of, the, of our Africana Institute. The Institute's mission is to revitalize, reconnect, and strengthen African global culture, social, and intellectual heritage. We have had on our campus world-renowned African and African diaspora scholars, performers, activists, and others who have held lectures, workshops, exhibits, and performances. Dr. Kalfani, sometimes we call him Akil, also serves as a director 
of our Center for Global Education and Experiences, which enables both students and faculty to study and teach abroad. Our students have studied in such diverse parts of the globe as Africa, South America, Europe, the Caribbean. Just this past summer, our faculty and students spent five weeks in Chengdu, China, studying and absorbing its culture. A two-week trip to Cuba is being planned for this spring. For those of you that are interested in taking advantage of this wonderful opportunity, see Dr. Palfani, and I believe there are flyers that are being distributed. So it is with great pleasure that the Office of the President has co-sponsored with the African Institute today's lecture program featuring our mayor, Ross Baraka, as our guest speaker. Now let's give a well-deserved round of applause and welcome on stage Dr. Kalfani. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ECC. Good afternoon. All right, welcome, welcome. Well, we want to welcome you all here. This is a powerful lecture series, a powerful opportunity for us to celebrate and to look at African, African diaspora history and culture. I want to uh, take a moment just to, uh, once again, to reiterate the words of uh, Dr. Monroe. <clears throat> I want to thank Dr. Monroe for, for sponsoring this and coming uh, uh, in partnership with the Africana Institute. I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, none other than Dr. Yamba, who was the, uh, the brainchild of the Africana Institute back in 2001. Let's give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> Next year, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So we need all of you to come and participate. The 20th anniversary of the Africana Institute is next year in May. Uh, so we want to definitely celebrate that. We want to thank the mayor. I'm going to say a few more words about him in a moment. Um, and I want to also just uh, give some reflections on this, this day. Uh, but I also want to, before I do that, I want to just thank uh, Professor Bridgeforth, who uh, hired me uh, at this college uh, many years ago. And I want to thank her and honor Dr. Bridgeforth. Uh, the superintendent of West Orange uh, School District is here, Dr. Cascone. I want to thank you for coming and bringing your students and staff. Uh, we appreciate you. We want to, this is a place for students, and so this is a great reflection on what we do for students in uh, Essex County and beyond. So we're celebrating Garvey and Nkrumah, Marcus Garvey and Nkrumah, uh, but this is an idea for us to understand what Pan-Africanism is about and what the struggles of those folks who endeavored to think about such a thing was about. But before we can do any of that, we first always, when we start programs like this, we want to, uh, and I'm going to call on Dr. Yama, we ask permission of the elders to begin. So Dr. Yama, can we begin? Thank you. Uh, and then also we call on our ancestors. See, we're not here by ourselves. Uh, we pour libations, and they do different in different places. So some places we use alcohol, I use water, because water is the cycle of life. Uh, we are, our bodies are mostly water. Uh, the world in which we live in is mostly water. And so then we pour water uh, into the earth, this plant down here, to, uh, to bring into being those uh, great ancestors who made it possible for us to be here today. So, uh, and this is participatory. I need your participata participation. So that means when I say pour water and I say something, I need you to say ashe. Can we try that now? Say ashe. Ashe. All right, thank you very much. So we are pouring libations. We recognize that we come from the beginnings of the beginnings and that those who came uh, many, many moons ago uh, made it possible for us to be here today. And their struggles and their strivings uh, are the things that created the possibility for us to do, know, understand language, to understand writing, to understand art and architecture. So for those who came many, many moons ago, we say Ashe. Ashe. Uh, for those who helped us to uh, uh, understand uh, who we are as people, who helped us to understand things, people like Imhotep helped us to understand what it means to, uh, to, to, to be an architect, what it means to be a physician. The first physician in the world was actually Imhotep. His okay. tools still exist for you to, to, uh, to check out today. So I, I, I suggest to you to go check out Imhotep. Uh, and you'll find the beginnings of modern day surgery that came from thousands and thousands of years ago. Ashe? Ashe. Uh, we are pouring libations 
for uh, those who uh, came in Middle Passage that we got here, many of us got here because some folks were taken from the continent, continent by force and so for the force that they experienced but the uh, upliftment that they did to, to make it for us to be here, we wouldn't be here if they didn't move beyond that bondage that they were that they were under. So for those who experienced that, but also helped us to lift beyond that, we say Ashe. Ashe. We pour libations also for we need to call out the names of certain folks. Now, as I'm introducing the mayor, uh, I want to uh, I pay ultimate respect because I, I loved his father uh, and because his father was meant so much to the movement. Uh, but uh, uh, Mary Baraka. Uh, somebody if we don't we call libations in the city of Newark that I always call libations for him here and other places that I am because uh, his ideas, his pushing the envelope helped me as a young person many years ago to think about what it meant to push the envelope, to think about what it meant to uh, uh, grasp this world in, by the horns and be involved and engaged in the process of changing things. So for Amir Baraka, we say Ashe. Ashe. Uh, there's a documentary out on Malcolm X now, we say Ashe. Ashe. Uh, Martin Luther King, Ashe. Ashe. Uh, and you guys can call out some names. Call out a couple of names because then we got to go into this video. Kwame Nkrumah. Ashe, there you go. Kwame Nkrumah, Dick Gregory, Ashe. Dr. Martin Luther King. Ashe. 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 Harry Tubman. Ashe. Bernie Mac. Ashe. Mark is gone. Ashe. And now we call out the names of your family members. Call your family members because we're going to change the space. This Essex County College will never be the same after today. So call out the names of your family members and make sure they're here with us. Hey, brother. And for all those whose names we didn't mention, we say Ashe. 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 Thank you very much. I want to introduce to you a man who is carrying on the mission and the ideas of Marcus Garvey and Nkrumah. A brother who I met many, many years ago who, before he was mayor, was, uh, many of you heard his voice on an album by someone named Lauren Hill. Uh, many of you uh, may have been students in his class at Central High School. Uh, many of you may have seen him at uh, city council meetings where he was a city council member for the South Ward here in the city of Newark. He honorably carries on the legacy of his mother and his father, and uh, carries on the, the, the legacy of even his sister uh, with the Shani Baraka Center here in, West, in, 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 uh, in Newark. He is somebody who embodies the ideas of Pan-Africanism and uh, is leading a city uh, in a direction to uh, begin to think about how the people of the city can do that, and as we Think about what he is doing and what he's done. I want to challenge you all to think about how you can see what he is doing as an example for what your contribution is going to be. Because the whole point of us having the Garvey and Kuma lecture series is not for us to sit up here and just uh, hear a lecture. It is for us to find out ways for us to engage in the world in which we live for us to find out a way to transform the world in which we live. We know this world is plagued with all kinds of problems, but it's up to you, up to us, to change that world. It's up to us to think broadly about where this world is today and what the impact on this world is that we can make. I offer you uh, Mayor Raz Baraka as someone who has taken that mantle and is passing the torch on to you as he continues to run in the marathon. So are you willing to take up the baton and run in the marathon? Oh, I guess not. Are y'all willing to take up the baton and run in the marathon? Are we going to be first place in the marathon? All right, well, I offer you, and let's give yourselves a round of applause for yourselves, but also for Mayor Baraka as he comes up and delivers to you a powerful message about how you're going to take up the baton. Mayor Baraka, everybody. Men's meeting, boy, you were seeing the, all those guys in there. It was very, very refreshing uh, that they want to do something in their community, in their city, uh, and not just waiting online for people to hand them something or give them something. That they want to take their communities back and build in their neighborhoods and control the, 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 the commerce uh, on their streets and on their blocks. It was a very, very exciting thing to see. Uh, just want to. 
first thank, uh, of course, uh, the president of this college's university, I'll call it the university, it's the New Jersey's HBCU. Uh, you know, uh, also, the, the Africana Institute, and Dr. Califani, uh, for your consistency and the work that you've been doing for a long period of time. And uh, you know, I thank you for in inviting me here, uh, and Al Bundy for making sure that you, you uh, made this happen. Also, have to give pay homage and, and, and thank Dr. Yamba for the work that he's done throughout the years. As many of us wouldn't be sitting here if he didn't labor in the vineyards to make this, uh, this institution uh, alive and well and, and real in the eyes of so many in this state. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate all of the young people uh, that are here, the professors and everybody else that thought it not robbery to show up here to hear little old me talk during the Black History Month program. You know, we don't get a lot of time to talk about ourselves during Black History Month, so we gotta take liberties right now. <laughs> we gotta say whatever it is that we wanted to say. Uh, all year, this is an opportunity to get it said. Uh, so I just wanna, I'm, I'm humbled to be invited to speak at a forum named after Marcus Garvey and Kwame uh, As Asaji Fo and Krumah. Marcus Mosiah Garvey and Kwame Osajifo and Krumah, they were real Pan-Africanists. They didn't just talk about the things they didn't like. They actually tried to build Pan-Africanism. Uh, they weren't uh, just academics. They, they didn't just contemplate the world as it should be or just go to the local protest or if social media was uh, around then, just troll people on social media. They actually tried to build Pan-Africanism. Garvey built the largest black organization in the history of this country. The UNIA had over two million members in it. We could barely get 15 people at some of our protests. Garvey had two million followers, which made him probably one of the most dangerous men in America at that time, one of the most dangerous people in the world. One God, one aim, one destiny. He created a printing press, grocery stores, laundries, a hotel, and a shipping line. Because of this, he was arrested and deported. Garvey was arrested and he was deported. He wasn't arrested for the things that they put in the media to make you feel uh, uh, why, he, like, why he was arrested or, or, or how they tried to uh, defame his name, but he was arrested because he really tried to organize, because he tried to own because he tried to support, because he tried to link black people in the Caribbean to black people in the South, to black people in America, to black people in Africa. He tried to link us all together under the banner of Pan-Africanism, under the banner of one aim, one God, one destiny. So he was arrested and later deported. Kwame Nkrumah, the leader of, you know, outside of Haiti, which is our first black republic, the leader of, the, the, uh, of what was once called the Gold Coast. 1957, he liberated Ghana with the help of his brethren. He fought for independence of Ghana through the English out uh, uh, and, and, and made Ghana what it is today. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is that he created something called the Organization of African Unity. And if you follow Malcolm X, he created something called the Organization of African American Unity, modeled after what uh, Kwame Nkrumah organized under the Organization of African Unity. He talked about one Africa, a lingua franca, a language that we can trade off of. He talked about one currency. He talked about uniting a continent. Uh, uh, he was years and years and years and years before his time. And so he was plotted against and overthrew. He was plotted against by the very people in his own camp, in his own circle. We understand that because those things still happen today. He was plotted against and thrown out, and, and he found refuge uh, in the neighboring country of Guinea. In Guinea, he was recognized as an honorary co-president under the leadership of another African revolutionary named Sekou Touré. See, if you don't know who Sekou Touré is, then you have a problem. If you don't know who Kwame Nkrumah is, then you should, you'd have a problem. If you don't know who Marcus Garvey is, but with Sekou Touré, there was Patrice Lumumba, there was Julius Nyeri, that was Ab Abdel Nasser, there was Jomo Kenyatta, 
And, you know, there was Amical Cabral. You can go in the Caribbean and find more. There was Maurice Bishop. There, there, there was, in this time period, you saw the liberation of these countries from colonial rule, the liberation of these countries, to begin to get political power in these countries. We still are fighting for economic power, but political power we began to get. And because of these people began to take power, they were overthrown, they were assassinated, they were deposed, they were removed. And if you're at a university and you don't know the history of these people, then you have to check out the classes that you're in. Kwame <laughs> Nkrumah and, and Marcus Garvey were learned men. They were learned men. They were scholars in their own right, and they were builders. They didn't just say what they were opposed to. Like I said, they tried to build what they thought should be in existence. And their betrayal, because they were betrayed. And their overthrow uh, is an example of how we are used, some of us, how we are used because of our back, the backwardness in our ideology, our thinking. Others not sophisticated enough to understand what my father would call unity and struggle. That is, that we have to struggle with each other, but also understand we have to unify around something bigger. We don't understand unity and struggle. Our, ideolo our ideology doesn't advance further than that. We have to be as sophisticated as Congress. He said they would argue about bills and laws, and at the end they say it's the law. The same Congress would, who would fight each other would come out, who would actually do and shoot and come out and say this is the law. We're not sophisticated to understand unity and struggle, so we, we, we use our differences with, with one another. In fact, our enemies use our differences with each other to cause division, destroy our movements, or because of our own personal dissatisfaction, our ideological nuances, or our desire to be the drum major, as King pointed out, our desire to be in the front, our desire to be the leader, our desire to be recognized, puts us against each other and allows our enemies to use us to destroy each other because we want to be the drum major, because we can't wait our time or we can't work together. We believe that we should be in the front. You should check out King's speech on drum major for justice. He lays it out really plain. The flaws that we have in our movement, the desire to be in front, causes us to destroy one another. The vulnerability of our skin which can be described clearly as just plain self-hatred. That we believe we have nothing of value to offer the world. Our missteps are magnified, our humanity questioned, our capacity minimized, and our efforts marginalized. That is, how could you think of a solution to this problem? You're just a poor black boy from Clinton Avenue who went to Madison Avenue and University High School. How could you think of answers to these questions? How can you solve these problems on your own? Surely you need somebody from outside to guide you, to lead you, to force you to do things because you can't think of it or do it on your own. And we believe that about each other. We believe that about each other because of decades and centuries of self-hatred and marginalization. We believe we have nothing to offer. That is why the celebration of Black History Month is incredibly important. Not just to freely and unapologetically express our beauty, our blackness to the world, to understand that God made us this way on purpose. My hair is kinky on purpose. My nose is wide on purpose. My lips are thick on purpose. The color of my skin is dark mahogany on purpose. That God made me the reflection of the universe on purpose. The original people this way on purpose. That we love ourselves because of this. Not We don't study Black History Month just because of that, but to deal with our own psyche, our own terribleness, that instinctive behavior to create a back door when one doesn't exist. That instinctive behavior to create a back door when one does not exist. Carter G. Woodson said, we've been going to the back so long that they don't have to force us to go to the back and go to the back on our own. But as a matter of fact, if there's not, if there's not a back, we'll create a back just so we can go through it. So that instinctiveness to create a back door when one does not exist, to be comfortable with our reflection, to understand that we are black, and we are black, and our children are black, and their children's children will be black, and our blackness is beautiful. We celebrate Black History Month, and men like Nkrumah and Garvey, not to re recreate what they did or live in those times, because that's scientifically impossible to do. We study them in our history to understand where we began 
where we have come through and to understand who we are and celebrate our greatness and power as a people in a world that tries to diminish that every day and in every institution imaginable. But more importantly, we study this to gather understanding, to build a roadmap so we are not marching in circles or going backwards, but moving forward, as Nkrumah said, forward ever, backward never. We study to learn the enemy's moves so we are not fooled by them over and over to understand strategies and programs that we may discern which of them worked and those that had no value. We enhance moves and create new ones. We study to continue the pathway, but we also chart new courses, create new discovery, discoveries that are in line with our destination. We study comparatively to assess our condition, our terrain, how far we are from reaching our goals, but most importantly, we study intently and purposefully as our lives depend on it. We don't study as a school project or class assignment. We're not just doing this for extra credit or to be to get in good with our professors or satisfy our teachers' desire to be an activist from their classroom or recreate a time when it existed they, uh, that they missed. We study because we want to see a future with us in it, because we understand that the world on the courts that's going on now is in a collision course with our values, our ability to be free that we made a conscious and woke decision to change that course. And in order to do that, we must study, study, study. Not troll on social media, but investigate, study, and organize. My father, very long ago, showed me the importance of study, of research. Study is important. He would say, my, and my mother would say, no investigation, no right to speak. It meant, and it meant that if you don't know what you're talking about, keep your mouth shut in layman's terms. And it meant you have access to this information, go get it. Read it, understand it, analyze it, study it. Don't just listen to what people say. Don't take sound bites. Go study it. Understand that. That forced me when I was at Howard University to sit in the Moreland Spingarn Library for hours at a time to get direct information of one of the largest libraries in the world buying about black people when they go back and forth with the Schomburg, Arturo Schomburg in Harlem on 125th Street. If you haven't been to the Schomburg, you should get there. Right? The, 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 that forced me in that library to begin to understand who I was, to begin to figure out how did I get here. What is my relationship to my people, to the world, to this economy? What am I supposed to be doing? And reading, and the more I read, the more I understood that I didn't know. And the more I didn't know, the more it inspired me to read more. And the more I read, the more careful I became with the things that I said. Because I understood that what I knew was very little. And that I needed to know more and more and more and more till I developed a thirst, the hunger for information, for knowledge. And so allow this Black History Month, if it has not already, if it has not done so for you years before, be a, a launch pad for you to begin to study, to deeply, deeply study the conditions uh, that you are in and your people. What is most relevant, what is most relevant is that my efforts, my position, when we talk about Black History Month, it always forces me to be retrospective, to think about what we've done and what we are doing, what is my role, and how have I added, how I have added, uh, or, or taken the baton, and how far I have moved it forward with the little bit of resources and, 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 and strength that we have. More importantly, it should make you ask those same questions. Some years after Garvey, after Nkrumah, the question you should ask is, where are we now? How are we viewed now? We're the only ones who came here against our will. They never came looking for employment. We didn't come looking for religious freedom. We wasn't running from persecution. We didn't think the streets were paved with gold. We had no papers. We were in the bottom of slave ships. We came from the Gulf of Guinea as property, codified in Dred Scott in 1857 as actually less than human beings. How did the world view us then? And how does the world view us now? What is the difference between how the world viewed us then and how the world view us now? How do they view us as three-fifths and, 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 and Dred Scott to say we could not sue because we were property? How do they view us still today in this present sense? How 
And, 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 what, and what's really, really, really mind-boggling to me in this, this, in this struggle, in this fight that this country seems to be having, this atmosphere, this idea about immigrants and undocumented versus document, documented in their quest for citizenship, it's really ironic to me when these people came here not as citizens but invaders. To make it difficult for people to become citizens in a land where history put them first. A land their ancestors occupied before they introduced smallpox and blankets, before broken treaties and colonial wars. The irony of it all is that Texas is Mexico. The, the, the irony of it all is that California is Mexico. So how do you take somebody's house and then make restrictions for them to get back into their home, uh, 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 for, them, for them to get in there? I do not understand why and how we are buying into this. And the reporter asked me the other day, what do I feel about it? I said, I know what it feels not to have papers. I said, I come from a people who never had any papers. In fact, if, they, if we walked off the plantation without papers, we get back. And sometimes we show the papers they gave us and we get back to the plantation anyway. There's a relationship there, and if you don't understand that, you should read some more. The struggle for black studies on these campuses, what did the result in? How much of yourself are you learning here? How much literature, philosophy, history, ideas that are central to us in our experience, what are you learning? And is it adding to your liberation as a thinking human being? Does it feed your soul, your experience, your desire to get up, to keep pushing, to change these intractable conditions? Does it feed you? Does it make you healthy? Does it make you strong? More importantly, is it informing you of your place in history, your collective push for equity and justice? What is it doing for you? Is it empowering you? If, if we fought for black studies 30 and 40 years ago, where is it at today? And, 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 and the classes that you have, how does it make you feel when you leave? And so the, the, the question becomes, now that we have black studies, who's teaching it? What books are we reading? And is it segregated? Because there's not American history, then there's black history, and only one history. Our history is in that history. America has no history without us. There's no American history than black history. It's only our history. It's only this country's history, right? There's no, there's no, we still have English classes. My father said we have an English department because we forgot that the English lost the war. <laughs> that that, that we, we, we study English literature, European literature. What about American literature? We don't study American literature because if you study American literature, you have to talk about W.B. Du Bois. You have to talk about Phyllis Wheatley. You have to talk about Maya Angelou. You have to talk about uh, 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 Nat Turner right. and the confessions of Nat Turner. You have to talk about all of these things and all of these people. That's America's history. That's American literature. You want to talk about American songs, American music? What about slave shouts and ring hollers? Right? And all these other things. That's American music. So, you know, what are we learning? And, and as we watch the presidential election, what's happening to us politically? We're being discussed as an opportunity, but not as opportunity for us. The debate is about how many black people they have promoted or who has treated us worse or said the worst things about us. We have to navigate between those people who say throw them up against the wall and, and those people who say lock them all up. We have to navigate between this, these things and that thing who's treated us the worst. Have you heard a serious agenda for us, even from the most progressive of candidates? Or is their idea of equity, of justice, being colorblind, as colorblind as the blindfolded lady of justice that have seen more of us in jail now than even at the height of slavery? Have we been thinking about what we are for, not just what we are against? Have we been thinking about our offensive strategy? Because I believe that we're so comfortable with defense, when we get the ball, we give it back. We've been so comfortable playing defense that we don't like offense. We give the ball back. We don't want an offensive strategy. We don't talk about alliances. We don't talk about unity and struggle. We don't talk about opportunities to work together, to build a united front. We, we, we still are fighting each other because we're so used to defense. 
We so used to defense, so used to defense, we about to score a touchdown and we throw the ball away. We work hard and we give it back. Listen, in these cities like Newark, where I am, you know, since 1968, Richard Hatcher, G Gary, Indiana, was one of the first African-American mayors that we've had. Those numbers are declining desperately all over the country. They presided over the Gary Convention in 1972. If you don't know about the Gary Convention, you should probably read that. Everybody should read the Gary Convention. I don't care what language you speak, what, where you're from, or uh, what's your nationality. You should know what the Gary Convention was. If you know the Democratic Convention, you should know about the Gary Convention of 1972, two years after the election of Kenneth Gibson. Uh, you know, they put together an, an agenda, uh, a so-called black agenda, that uh, cities uh, tried to take up for years and years and years that has not been fulfilled yet. In these cities, we still struggle with the same problems that exist because the system still exists. Mm. It exists because white supremacy still exists. Okay. It exists because we, we because uh, we in a system, a, a system of capitalism, it still exists. These problems still exist. They exist. And we are still struggling trying to get rid of these problems. As a matter of fact, we are trying to push back against natural forces whose desire is to crush us, that we try to shelter and buttress as many of our folks that we can from disaster that has pl been planned, in fact, embedded in this place even before we walked off the plantation. Mm. So we, what we're doing is being reactionary. We're trying to save people. Right, and, and all the efforts that, 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 that we do, even around the country, is trying to save as many people as we can, preserve as, as much life as we can, make people's lives come. We're, we're, we're working in hospice. We're working in hospice. We, we, we're the critical agency to try to make sure. And then, then people deal with us. We go back and forth with people about how many people did we save. How many, we go from 100 murders to 50. Right, we, 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 we figure these things out, we struggle, right? And then each, 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 because we're not, we not dealing with the systemic issues, each mayor has to go back and forth with the constituency about how far they've gotten us from slavery. And, and, and there's no real, real, real collective discussion, no real collective discussion about what is our offense. We like the story of David, Goliath, David and Goliath without the slingshot. This is what we struggle with economically. And where are we, I mean politically, and where are we economically? And, and, and though there are more of us in school, more of us that have joined the ranks of the well-to-do, the wealth gap has widened. And in fact, according to some economists, it'll take 700 years for it to close. And while in fact many of us have achieved some economic prosperity, it is not guaranteed that prosperity will be passed down generationally. The data tells us that even if you make, make it, uh, there is no guarantee that your own children will experience the same outcomes that you experience. That half of our children grow up in deep poverty, deep intractable poverty. And some 50 years after Brown versus Board of Education, 70% of our children still go to segregated schools okay. by race and now also by class. In fact, the school that Thurgood Marshall went to, the high school that Thurgood Marshall graduated from, you know, the author of Brown versus Y'all know Thurgood Marshall, right? I can't take anything for granted. Uh, 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 the, the high school that Thurgood Marshall went to in Baltimore, Frederick Douglass High School, is still segregated today. In fact, it was the first school when, when, when Baltimore had their little uprising uh, because of the Freddie Gray issue. It was the first school where the students came outside and protested. Frederick Douglass Academy, that is the school of Thurgood Marshall, but it's still 90% African American. Mm. Now, not only is it just 90% African American, it is also 90% economically disadvantaged. Mm. So not only is it segregated now by race, but it's also segregated by class. Mm. And, that is, and, and that is an example of all of, mostly all of these schools in these communities, right? Because the minute we get Something, we go. We're still fighting for jobs, justice, and humanity, decades after the March on Washington, and are still struggling to maintain our voting rights more than 50 years after the Voting Rights Act. And while the world is focused on Donald Trump, they've been focused on stealing our, our voting rights. 
while we've been focused on Donald Trump, they've been focused on appointing federal judges. While we've been focused on Donald Trump, they've been repealing every opportunity that we've had. They've been re repealing uh, uh, issues around welfare. They've been repealing I issues around women, infant, and children. Moving all of these things backwards, 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 while we focused on Donald Trump and his crazy tweets and the foolishness that he's doing in, 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 in Europe. And we're talking about Russian collusion. Well, the Russians ain't stop your grandmother from voting. People in America did that, right? And, and so it's, it's important for us not to lose sight of, of where we are. And what about the sanctity of our lives? I'm going to bring us to an end, because I know I'm probably bothering a few people in here. But what about the sanctity of our lives? The sanctity, how, we, how, how people treat us, how we feel, right? You know, what about that? You know, in 1919, a man named Will Brown in Omaha was accused of assaulting a white woman named Agnes Lobag. He was taken into custody, and shortly thereafter, white folks in the town rioted, not in Baltimore or Newark, but in Omaha. They burned stores and looted guns and gasoline. They opened fire on the courthouse where Will Brown was held. The mayor came out of the courthouse and tried to calm the crowd down. He was hit over the head and knocked unconscious and thrown across a lamppost to be hung, but was saved by other people in the town. They eventually got their hands on Will Brown and beat him and tore his clothes off, threw him over another lamppost, riddled his body with bullets, and dragged him through the center of town on the back of a truck, and burned his body at the stake, then sold pieces of the rope that he was lynched with as souvenirs for 10 cents. For 10 cents. This was a real riot. And we could say, oh, Mayor, this is 1919. What about Walter Scott? 2015, he ran from the police at a traffic stop because of child support. Was gunned down in his back by Tamir Rice or Sean Bell or Amr Diallo or Mike Brown. Or in 2012, Officer Michael Brelow in Cleveland stood on the hood of his car and shot his gun 49 times through the windshield at two unarmed black passengers that was ultimately shot at almost 140 times. He was found not guilty after they mistakenly thought his car backfiring was a gun was gunfire. Mm. This is not 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. It is present day. Present day. So our struggle, our fight for the sanctity of our lives is still relevant today. I was in a class at University High School and, it, and then a young girl raised her hand. She said, why are people always talking about slavery? I said, well, one, you need to know your foundation right here. But secondly, we don't have to talk about slavery. Uh, there are things that are happening today That's right. that you need to be involved in, that you need to be engaged in. And the real problem is why are you divorced from your history? <laughs> why, what, where, where did the breakdown, where did the linkage, what, what mistake did we make, make not to pass this information down from, 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 from generation to generation so our kids are not talking about why are we talking about slavery, but say, as other folks say, we will never forget. That's right. We will never forget. And the reason you shouldn't forget is so it's not done again. So it's not perpetuated. So I agree with the, with the, the statement, never forget. You should never forget oppression. You should never forget tyranny. You should never forget Holocaust. You should never forget slavery. You should never forget all of those things. Why? Because you want a world with that, with that doesn't have room to exist anymore. You never forget it, and you remember the things and the conditions that brought it into existence. There are three things I, before I close I want to focus on. One of them is poverty. And I have to talk about poverty uh, because I, I live in a city um, in Essex County um, where uh, the average wealth of a family is uh, less than $30,000. If you travel seven to eight miles in the same county to Milburn, the average wealth of a family is about $120,000, $130,000, right? In the same county. That, that wealth gap is so mass, it's so huge, and so even when we doing, trying to create affordable housing and they, and they use the area median income and they try to use the median income of the area around here, it's distorted to us because if we use the county's median income, the gap is so big, there's some people in the county who, who, whose households uh, make one hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, right? And so, uh, uh, and then there are people all the way here who could go as low as ten thousand dollars, right? It's uneven. So we have to talk about poverty. Poverty is important for us because poverty for us began in slavery. 
We worked for free for centuries to make cotton king, to build the shipping industry, insurance, textiles, and so on. In fact, in 1860, 60% of the country's wealth was created by 4 million slaves. And so the, the foundation of the institutions of this country was created from free labor. Our collective poverty is a direct, direct result of our enslavement and everything that came after it, from Plessy versus Ferguson to redlining. On top of that, most of the wealth created in this country has been always concentrated in the hands of a few people. And it has grown even more stark. In fact, according to Forbes magazine, the three richest Americans hold more wealth than the bottom 50% of this country. Just imagine that. Can you imagine that much money? The three richest Americans have more wealth than the bottom 50% of the people in this country. <clears throat> This is a normal progression of the system, though. We live under this. And while we fight for increased wages, which I agree with, we fight for labor rights, and I agree with it, we, we even fight for guaranteed income, as King spoke of, for opportunities to redistribute that wealth through social programs, free education, health care, employment, that we push uh, to, to, to make things equal. Uh, we, we push to make sure there's an economy that's fair, that's right, uh, 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 that, we, that the whole is compensated, right? That we fight for those things. And you listen to the, the, the presidential candidates and everybody else talking about we, we need, a, even in this state, a fair and equal economy that all of us can, can move on the same page from. We have to remember that the playing field was not equal for us. And, 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 and the right thing for us to do is to fight for an equal playing field, but we also have to fight for equity. We have to make sure and I'm, and I'm putting this out there, we have to make sure that we've been made whole, that we've been compensated, that we've been repaired. We have to be repaired for the death of Mega Evers in his wife's arms. We have to be repaired for over 4,000 known lynchings in this country. We have to be prepared for Dred Scott, for Plessy versus Ferguson, for all the Supreme Court cases that marginalized us, that made us in, 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 uh, inhuman. We have to be prepared for those things. We have to be prepared for redlining. We have to be prepared for decades and decades and decades of segregation. We have to be prepared. We got to add it up. We got to add it up. We have to be prepared. Everything that we get is owed to us. That's the mentality that you have. Hell, if I can get farm subsidies, housing assistance, wealth, I take it all. I tell people, don't be ashamed of our welfare. They don't pay you enough for the things that they stole from you. We got to make everything equal, but we also need to be prepared. Do not allow the people to get off the hook by saying that we're going to make everything fair and equal because fair and equal doesn't repair our condition. It needs to be fair, it needs to be equal, but we also need reparations. And as, and as political candidates talk about it as a, as a, as a phrase word, they use it to gain political leverage over the other, we have to talk about it for real. We have to put together a think tank. All of you young, brilliant people have to put together a think tank to figure out what reparations looks like. How do we get reparations in, in the state of New Jersey? How do you get reparations in, in the state of New Jersey, the last state that abolished slavery? How, how do you get reparations in these places, right? There's an African burial ground under New Jersey Performing Arts Center. How, how do you get reparations for these things, right? We need reparations. Don't allow these people to say class is going to fix everything. It's going to fix a lot of things, but it ain't going to fix Mega Evans' blood on his wife's lap in, in 1963 trying to organize so people could vote. It ain't going to fix Fannie Lou Hamer, who had to go to Atlantic City and make sure that we were included in the Democratic Party. It ain't going to fix that. It's not going to fix the assassination of Martin Luther King, the murder of Malcolm X, the deportation of Martha Garvey, the killing of all of our leaders. It's not going to fix any of those things. I'm not going to fix any of those things. And so the reality is you need reparations. And I'm talking like this on purpose. It ain't going to fix the black codes. It ain't going to fix vagrancy laws. It ain't going to fix banks that refuse to give you a loan. It ain't going to uh, fix the foreclosure crisis that took 50% of the wealth from our community in one fell swoop. It's not going to fix any of those things. So we have to be clear on that. Yeah, we need an increase in the minimum wage. Yeah, we need fair labor conditions. Yeah, we need free education and free health care. Yeah, we need all of those things, but damn we need reparations too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reparations, man. The, the, the second thing, I'm going to put them together, is democracy and self-determination. 
We can't, we can't ask for one and see what happens. We can't ask for one without the other. Some of us fight for democracy and don't understand self-determination, but we fight for self-determination and don't understand democracy. My father made it clear to me that we need democracy and self-determination, meaning we here now. We ain't going back. We here. So if you didn't want us here, you shouldn't have brought us here. So, and he was saying, if everybody go back to where they belong, the airport to be crowded. Because don't none of us belong here. But, but, at the, but at the end of the day, whatever is given to any American should be given to all of us. We have a right to public schools. We have a right to, uh, to not to be shot down in the middle of the street. We have the right to the same rights that, that is laid out in the Constitution of the state of New Jersey, the Constitution of the United States of America. We have those rights as any other American. We have those rights as citizens of this country. We have those rights. We have the rights because Christmas addicts died in a revolutionary war. We have those rights because we fought in every war this country offered. We fought, we gave our lives, and then came back to segregation, came back to hatred, came back to lynching, came back to Jim Crow. We have a right to be treated as Americans. Our blood on this soil gives us the right to be Americans. As a matter of fact, Paul Robeson, when he was being, when he was put before the House of Un-American Activities, they told him, if you don't like it here so much, why don't you leave? He said, I'm not going anywhere because my father was a sharecropper and his father was a slave. And I'm not going to let any fascist-minded people drive me away from this. I have more claim to this spot than anybody here because my ancestors died here. So we can't struggle with people because they're fighting for democracy. They should be fighting for the right to vote. We should be fighting for the right to vote. We should be right fighting for the equal treatment. We should be protesting and marching and fighting for democracy in this country. But we also have a right to self-determination. That's right. We have a right to pray to who we want to pray to, to look like how we want to look. We have a right to color our gods black and brown if we choose to do so. We have the right to speak in any language we want to. We have a right to build any, in any institutions we want to. We have the right to self-determination, to say the things that empower us, that, that, that make us love each other, our families. We have a right to this because we're human beings, not because we're citizens of a country, but because our humanity demands the right for us to do the things that other human beings have the right to do. We have the right to our own ideas, our own philosophy, our own art, our own culture. We have the right to express ourselves by moving our hands if we like to. I have the right to talk in slang if I want to, to use double negative if I like to. I have the right to do that self-determination. I can speak in English because I went to school, so I know the king's English, but I can talk the way I want to talk because I can do it too. That's self-determination. I have the right to do that. I have the right to do that, to express myself in the way that I see fit. Does everybody else have that right? To dress the way they want, to talk the way they want, to walk the way they want, to pray to who they want to pray to, we have a right to do the same thing. And you should not be against people who want those rights, because that's the right to self-determination. That's what Marcus Garvey talked about. You got a right to our own banks. We don't have to go to your bank to build our own. We have to wear your clothes, we can make our own clothes. I, 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 I wore an African outfit to the state of the city, and somebody said, why do you do that? Because I have a right to. I have a right to. I can wear what I want to wear. I don't have to wear what other people say is the right thing to wear. I can wear what I want to wear. I can walk in there and look like an African leader if I want to because I wanted to that day. And next time I might not want to. But that's my right to do so. Democracy and self-determination, you have to understand those things. And lastly, education. We have to educate ourselves. There's the, the pathway to liberation is through education. You have to educate yourself. You got Kwame Nkrumah went to Lincoln University. He went to Lincoln University. He educated himself, went back, and liberated his country. Many of those African leaders, if you study, came and studied in these schools, took the information that they got, went back, and liberated their own countries. They took the information, they went to London. Marcus Garvey studied in England. He studied in London and came back to the Caribbean and in, in, in the US and began to organize. So the, the education is important. You can't throw education aside. And just because you're sitting in class, formal education is not all education. You have this generation 
has access to more information than any other generation that came before them. You have the opportunity to get as much information as you can. If you don't do that, you're portraying yourself in hundreds and thousands of people who came before you. I don't have any illusion that I'm the smartest person dealing with these issues. There are people who came before me, like Du Bois, was brilliant. Frederick Douglass, brilliant. Henry Hyde and Garnett, brilliant people who grappled with these ideas. The only thing I can do is my part. And I have to read and study and understand and analyze and fall down and get back up. Studying helps you do that, right? But we have to love ourselves to give us room to study and try and push because sometimes when we fall down, we don't give each other the right to get back up. We have to understand that we're still a baby at this thing. Other civilizations are thousands of years old. You know, this, 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 this country is not that old in comparison to the rest of the world. So at the end of the day, we're still struggling here trying to figure out what democracy looks like, what self-determination for us looks like. We're still struggling. And so we need you, students, to read, to study, to inform yourselves, to motivate and encourage yourselves to get more information and more. And if you like, if you want to be like Kwame and then read and learn and understand. And if you're from uh, the continent, then you should go back there and try to figure out how to move it forward and how to connect the people here to the folks over there, how to create pan-African unity and ultimately world unity. That's what you have to do, the people of the world, right? You have to figure out how to do that, and that begins with study. It begins with education. That's why it's important for us, important for me, to come to, to schools and colleges and universities to excite you enough to want to go back, you know, to tease you enough to go and read the stuff that I said. Don't listen to anything. Don't take anything that I said for face value. That's right. Don't believe nothing that I said up here. Go study it for yourself. I could have made up everything I said. <laughs> go and read it. Go find out on your own. Go study on your own. Don't look at no clip on, on Facebook, some headline on Facebook, <laughs> and, and, and think that that is the information. No. You got to take that and begin to deep dig deep into it and study what's going on. You go to school to solve problems, not to get rich. You, so you go to school to solve problems. There are people who don't go to school who are rich. Right. Never went to school, they're rich. They'll tell you stories about how they dropped out of school and they're rich. Right? right? So your, 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 your purpose here is not to just be wealthy to get rich. Your purpose is to solve problems. That's your purpose. Solve problems. Build the world. Create Fix something that we all comfortable living in that benefits us all, our, our physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health. Build something different that exists now. Use the power that you're getting from the education in this class to change and transform this world. Thank you for inviting me. favorite books? My favorite books? Well, when I, when I was a young man, I, the, my first book that I probably read was the Autobiography of Malcolm X, right? Uh, but uh, as a, these still remain my favorite books. How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Walter Rodney. That's probably uh, one of the most premier books in my mind that helped me understand the forces of e e e economics and how the depopulation of the continent in terms of human resources and real raw materials 
kind of uh, devalued or underdeveloped the continent and developed the rest of the world. And we begin to understand that relationship, it, it puts you square in the center uh, and to try to figure out how to fix that or repair that and what you need to do. Uh, that, that's incredibly uh, important to me. Uh, the, the, there's a bunch of, uh, I would just like to give you a book list if, if you let me do that, right? If you give me a, your email, I'll give you a book list and I'll just go through the whole thing and stuff. about reparations I see how the Jews do it how do we like what what is the starting point like what is how do you get that's a, that's a great question you know what's interesting this is probably the first presidential election that they've had probably ever that they began talking about reparations and I've seen it on debate stages that they began saying reparations I think there's a whole discussion about uh, and some of them, even the most progressive candidates refuse to say reparations right because they don't, they don't want to fall into a situation where they feel like they have to do something now and obligate themselves to African Americans in this country. Uh, reparations could be in the form of free education. It could be in the form of earned income tax credit. It could be in the form of expansion uh, or, uh, or the amount of dollars that are given to families. It could be, it could, it, it could be a bunch of things. That's why I'm saying it takes us to have a, because there's a, a lot of people who've been thinking about what, what reparations look like. There's somebody in Queen Mother Moore who used to go around all the time, we need reparations, we need reparations. So to, we need folks to figure out, go from the ideological to the pragmatic. And I think it's, it's, it, we need some students and some young people to figure out how to get us there, right? Because we say reparations, it can mean a bunch of things. They get on TV tomorrow and say we're going to give everybody $150 or even $10,000. That $10,000 will go away. So we need to figure out what reparation really means because they obviously don't have enough money to pay us for all the things that we've, that we've been through. So it's important for us to figure out what reparations is going to look like to every family uh, uh, in this country uh, of African descent that are here. Hi, I just wanted to know if you had any words for any of the future leaders here, any kind of um, motivation, I mean, aside from everything that you've done, it's been amazing. Yeah, I, I would say keep pushing. No, you had the, we used to have study groups, and I think it's important to have study groups. It's important to, uh, it's important to bring, uh, to have conferences and events and bring speakers. I mean, I used to go to like two or three different conferences a year because we would have all these people would have all these conferences all over the country. We would travel and meet people. The, the, with the advent of social media, it makes it easier for us to just communicate back and forth under false names and say all kinds of stuff like that. We actually had to challenge each other. So if, if I disagree with California, I would make sure I saw him at the next Malcolm X Grassroots uh, Conference and we would talk, we have a conversation in the hallway, a conversation somewhere and challenge each other on ideas, right? Not we didn't just troll or call each other names. We actually challenge each other on ideas that we said we believed and thought and felt. And so it's important for us to push each other by challenging each other. That's what unity and struggle is about. Like I don't have a problem with people disagreeing with me. You, you, you just have to know when you disagree with me, I might disagree with you too, right? And so we, we have to give each other room to have a debate and then figure out that our unity is greater than our difference. So that's important. So I, I would say study groups, are, uh, we need study groups because we talk a lot, we just don't read a lot. All right, let's uh, give the mayor another round of applause, please. While we're here, we have two things left I want to do while the mayor is here. One, I want to thank all the people who you see behind me, the list of folks who made it possible for this to happen today. Uh, I want to thank the, the folks in the mayor's office who helped to make this uh, possible. Uh, Al Bundy, uh, the, the, the uh, president's office, all those folks who made it possible today. Uh, student life and activities, MPT, graphics department, and on the list of all the names of the folks that you see here, I want to also um, uh, recognize Reverend Roundtree and I uh, give her a round of applause. Uh, all the folks who came out today, uh, uh, Alan Tomalescu, uh, all the folks who came out today, we appreciate all of you coming out, all the faculty for coming out. Uh, we appreciate you. We wouldn't be able to be here without you. It, it means so much. And with that said, I want to invite Dr. Monroe back up to the, to the stage. Let's give Dr. Monroe another round of applause. Thank you, uh, Akil Kalfani. Mr. Mayor, you have once again wowed us with your powerful message, which has been informative, encouraging, challenging, thought-provoking. And we, on behalf of Essex County College, want to present you with a small token of appreciation for not only taking your time, but putting your passion into all that you imparted today. So thank you very much, sir. 
And I want to I want to um, ask Dr. Yamba, who started this all, to come up and say a few words. Give Dr. Yamba. What a wonderful lecture series, you know, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for those wise words. But in addition to all the readings that, you know, he gave us to take a look at, basically his foundation came from the home. His father and mother, you know, really schooled him even before he went to Howard University. So I want you guys to go there. So again, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for this, uh, for coming to grace us with your presence and also the words of wisdom that you've imparted upon us. And to Dr. Monroe, continuing the legacy and supporting this series. And of course, Akil, the torch was passed to you in terms of the Africana Institute, which was opened by the Mutufu, the, the, the Shanti King of Ghana, who came and opened the Africana Institute. And Akil has carried on that tradition and raised it to even higher levels. So again, to Western Tony College, wonderful lecture series, and I wish you more of this type of dialogue, if you will, where we can engage in some meaningful discussion, but above all, put those discussions into action. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Uh, we, have, we have refreshments for everyone outside, so please uh, enjoy the refreshments outside, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you.